All right, welcome and good evening, everybody. Glad to see everybody here. Uh, my name is JP Eggers. I'm the Vice Dean for MBA and Graduate Programs for here at NYU Stern. And I'm excited to be here tonight for this incredible program that we've got lined up and I'm very excited to see so many uh, alumni and friends of Stern in the room uh, back for this as well. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Paul Doherty, the co-author of the recent, recently published book, Human and Machine, Reimagining Work in the Age of AI, in conversation this evening with our own, uh, our own uh, Professor Arun Sundararajan. Paul is the Chief Technology Officer at Accenture, leads the company's technology and innovation and ecosystem group. In this role, he oversees technology strategy, R&D, ecosystem relationships, and responsible for Accenture's business in emerging tech, such as AI, cloud, blockchain. He's a frequent speaker at conferences on industry and technology issues, and published articles in a variety of publications. He sponsors Accenture's technology initiatives for the World Economic Forum. He's received a variety of honors, Ad Week 50 20, 2017, Business Transformation 150, I could go on, but I think we want to get to the main event, uh, as opposed to m hearing me lay out a whole bunch of uh, cool awards that he has won at this point. Um, and our moderator this evening, as I said, uh, is Professor Arun Sundararajan, uh, Professor of Business and, and Robert L. and Dale Atkins Rosen Faculty Fellow. Um, Human, Human and Machine was published in tw March 2018, been a favorite among academics, industry experts, and it's based on personal experience and research with 1,500 organizations. The book reveals how companies are using the new rules of AI to leap ahead on innovation and profitability, as well as what you can do to achieve similar results. And if you look at within the book, the book really talks a lot about the ways and the future of work and the ways in which, uh, in kind of through Paul's perspective, that humans and machines will be interacting in getting work done in the future and these ways in which these interactions will take place and marches through a number of different areas and use cases from things that are more, maybe more obvious around manufacturing to things that are maybe less obvious around research and development and marketing and things like that. So we're quite honored to have Paul here for, with, us, with us this evening. So without further ado, please join me in welcome, welcoming Paul Doherty and Arun Sundararajan. Thank you, JP. Um, Paul, it's uh, always a pleasure to converse with you. Um, it's even more fun when we have an yeah, audience. We, we, we've done this a lot of times before, so this is yeah. going to be a, a good, so good is, opportunity um, to chat. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I just, just want to start with, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for taking the time. I know that you're a busy guy. Um, I've read your book. Um, you were kind enough to send me a copy. Enjoyed it. Um, um, what was the motivation? I mean, like, you know, what what, what made you decide that you're going to sort of take time out of doing all the other things that you have to do and actually sort of knuckle down and write the book? Yeah, no, good, good question. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining. And thanks to NYU and Stern for hosting. And it's great to be to have the opportunity to talk to you in this forum, as we've uh, talked in many other forums. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the reason for the book, uh, it started about now four years ago. Uh, as I said, the book was published a year ago this week, so it's uh, it's one year. It's its official birthday uh, t uh, this week, and uh, we started the research about four years ago. And uh, it was I remember the the moment I was in in Cambridge in Massachusetts with my co-author coming out of some meetings uh, where it, our, my co-author leads our, our technology research, including our research in artificial intelligence. And we came out of some meetings and we were just discouraged because we felt the narrative um, that we kept encountering at that meeting and others. Was, uh, was the wrong narrative and different than what we saw in our own experience with artificial intelligence. And the narrative at the time was AI is this thing we, we need to be afraid of. It's a thing <clears throat> we might not be able to control. It's going to eliminate all the jobs. And, um, and peop people making a lot of claims without a lot of, subs uh, of subs you know, substantiation behind them. Yeah. And our concern at the time was um, in, in these types of areas, uh, the wrong, you know, prophecy or the wrong beliefs can turn you know, into self, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. If if you interpret the technology as bad, it's going to imp influence what you do. If you interpret it as a technology that's there to eliminate people, you're going to figure out ways to do it. And we felt that was the wrong approach, and so we felt that. Uh, we wanted to set the record straight based on our experience. So we had our own hunch, we had our own personal experience, because at the time we had done a lot of work already with artificial intelligence. But we launched this research project to, to look at 1,500 organizations and many more thousands of workers you know, with a lot of first-hand research to understand what was really happening in the jobs. 
And our goal was to try to educate and provide a roadmap to uh, business executives and people who are in organizations to help them understand what we thought was the, the right way to apply AI. Okay, so what is, what is the right way to apply AI? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, after all that. I'm gonna the, keep my question short. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so there's three key things we talk about in the book, and we can dive into any, any yeah. one of them. Uh, but I'll start with the title. So the, the way I summarize the book is, you know, if, if, if not many people read, how many of you still read books? End to end, covered. Oh wow, this is a good audience. Yeah, this is this is a not a representative. Yeah, not a good. Uh, but a lot of people don't read books. So if you don't read the whole book, a lot of people just read the table of contents of the introduction or conclusion. But the, the this is um, a group of people who have come for a book talk. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, yeah, you know, self-selecting. Yeah. So the uh, the the most you know, the, the most important point in, in the book is the plus sign that the human plus machine, and the the view we have that the real potential is in how you combine the human capability and the machine capability, the human yeah. intelligence, the machine intelligence. That's the the main message of the book. And then there's three kind of core findings in the book. The first is that um, you need to take a different approach to business and business process to unlock the potential of AI. And uh, we talk about the third generation of business process and the third generation of work in the book, the first being automation, the second being re-engineering, and the third being what we call reimagination, which is thinking about your business in a different way to really unlock the potential of AI. I can give you know, some, some examples of that if you're interested, but it's, it's a new approach to your business. It's uh, it, it re this reimagination approach is the first finding. The second is what we call the missing middle, which is a new view of how to identify jobs, a, a new, a new uh, view of what jobs look like as AI matures and rolls through companies. And we call it the missing middle because it's the jobs that are in the middle between in between the human and, and meld, you know, merging the human and machine capability. Okay. And we call it missing, you know, the missing middle, because people you know, were, were largely not thinking, at least four years ago, and still even today, not thinking about a lot of these new categories of jobs that are already starting to emerge. And we believe that, too, if you want to properly prepare people and properly prepare your organization, you need to know what those new roles look like. So that's the missing middle. We can get into what some of those jobs yeah. look like. And then the third uh, finding of the book is uh, around responsible AI. And uh, we found that companies that are pursuing what we deem a responsible approach to AI are having greater success and having greater returns than those who are not. And responsible AI, is, again, as we could probably spend the whole time, the whole session on, because it's very much in discussion now. It was early when we were looking at this a few years ago. But it's, it's the, we define responsible AI as accountability, uh, uh, accountability for decisions, transparency, uh, fairness, lack of bias, honesty, and, and a human agency in the way that you approach AI. And uh, it's, it's believe that this is a, a big moment in, for, cor for companies and organizations to really embrace a new code of conduct and a new way of operating around responsible AI if you want to get the benefits and avoid the pitfalls of AI. Okay. I mean, and I'll come back to each of these. Yeah. I mean, each of these are really interesting. I also want to sort of come back at some point to talking about skills for the future. Right. And um, you know, this is a, a question that I see asked by so many companies, like you know, as we're retraining, who sh what, sh what should we yep. retrain people for? But right. um, I wanted to sort of go back and start with your definition of AI, because um, I'm a professor and I like definitions, but um, also because AI is one of the most sort of poorly defined things in general. Um, it's it's, it's a, you know, that, that extreme, those, two extremes that you point to, right? I mean, there's sort of stuff that humans do, and then the other extreme is like, you know, machines magically becoming human-like, and that's conceptually what a lot of people think of as AI. And you've got a very precise definition, which I've written down here. Um, systems that extend human capability by sensing, comprehending, acting, and learning, mm -hmm. right? And so just sort of, can you tell us a bit more about that? I mean, what? Why, why do you draw these as the boundaries around artificial intelligence? I mean, when people encounter new technologies, like how should they decide that this is AI that we're dealing with? Yeah, I mean, there's, that's kind of the, the way we, it's kind of the, our business definition of how to think about AI. So AI is you know, kind of a system that can sense, so it can, you know, think computer vision or, natural language capability, so it can sense yeah. and take input. It can uh, comprehend, so it can you know, understand and reason and see patterns and make, uh, yeah. uh, and make distinctions. 
uh, act, you know, can make decisions or take action in the case of autonomous uh, vehicles and the like, and then learn and Im improve, you know, uh, and cycle around. So that's the way we define uh, an intelligence system or artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, the the uh, more simple definition I sometimes use is in audiences who are less into AI is it's systems that approximate, approximate human-like capability to yeah. do different things. That's another easy definition. Um, and then there's the technology. The way technology-wise we look at it, a lot of people are calling a lot of different things AI. Um, and there's, broadly speaking, I, the way I look at it at least, there's, there's broadly speaking, there's a machine learning kind of uh, uh, domain of AI which is focused on you know, the statistical reasoning, data science, deep learning, yeah. uh, all, all those types of, of technologies. And then you've got the symbolic reasoning side of AI, which isn't talked about as much now, but was the big thing about 20 yeah. years ago. And that's another branch of AI that's kind of you know, underappreciated maybe today because of some of the advances we've seen in the machine learning branch. So from a technology perspective, one thing uh, I believe is really important to look at is the full breadth of AI capability because I think a lot of organizations are over pivoting on you know, supervised learning and very specific techniques that we've had a lot of advances recently and maybe missing the opportunity to combine you know, different AI techniques and achieve, you know, achieve uh, you know, greater outcomes as a result. Yeah, and, and, and I, I was struck by the fact that, um, I mean, we're all big fans of deep learning here at NYU, especially today, mm. like Jan LeCun. It's a big day, the, yeah. Uh, the Congratulations Award to Jan LeCun so. and Jeff Hinton, and yeah. uh, uh, who's the third? Uh, Jan, oh, and uh, uh, Yushio Benjio yeah, yes. won the Turing Award today, for those yeah. who didn't see that, yeah. Um, but the, you know, I, I also noticed that you've got sort of, you, you explicitly talk about extending human capability. So I interpreted that in two different ways. One is sort of really broadly, meaning that the capabilities of humanity at large are extended by these systems. But the other was it sort of seemed to be a nudge towards what you get at in the book, that you think of AI as sort of like, you know, this missing middle of AI as being sort of really important, right? Where there's the complementarity between the human being and the AI. So was, was that intentionally to sort of orient us towards thinking about the humans and the machines working together, or did you just sort of mean the broad humanity? No, it's, it's a little... I'll, it's, I'll, I'll get past the definition in a, mi in a minute. Yeah, no, like, no, know, it's fine. It, it's, I think it's important. The, when we talk about the human plus machine, we mean very literally an individual person equipped with tools and technology, you know, powered by AI in this case, that can help them do things differently. So that we're very intentionally talking about the, the change in, 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 the, in the way an individual works and lives, empowered and augmented by technology in a different way. And, uh, but we're also then talking about the collective impact that has on, uh, okay. on our ability to solve problems and, and achieve solutions in a different way. Both are really important. And I think, the, this, that's, I think it's really important to look at, that's why we spent so much of our time in the research looking at the individual impact. Is our, our belief that to, to this issue of jobs, um, we are, uh, I am, we are, you know, based on our research, cautious optimists on the jobs issue. Uh, I don't believe we'll have a jobs issue in the next 10 years, probably not the next 20 years, uh, due to automation or AI. We will have a lot of skill issues. Yeah. Uh, but we won't have job issues because fundamentally AI isn't eliminating as many jobs as, as we think. Uh, AI is automating a lot of tasks, uh, and tasks aren't always the same as jobs, and the, the pace of automation isn't always what we think it is. So we can talk about specific numbers and statistics and everything if you like, but it's really important to look at that individual level because that's where you can really see the impact on individual jobs. And then in the macro level, there's uh, we're, we're, that's why it's important to think about responsible AI and these types of things because yeah. the individual use of AI can have unintended consequences societally. And it, it's, it's a new obligation for business to look out for and think about the collective impact that their AI that they're deploying is having on communities around them. For example, is deviating to the responsible AI point for a minute, yeah. you know, there's a bank who, who uh, got themselves into trouble by uh, developing a, 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 new, a lending algorithm that they trained with uh, demographic data from a more rural application area that they then applied in an urban area and very instantaneously scaled a racially biased lending algorithm because it had been trained on characteristics that didn't reflect the population they're deploying it in. A basic, basic issue that they should have caught and not have done, but those, those are the types of 
things we need to think about in the mindset and the types of impact that organizations can very easily have uh, you know, collectively on a community uh, that, that they need to think about differently in the era we're moving yeah. into. So let's, let's sort of, let, let's, let's go a little bit further on that because I, I think this is a topic that comes up frequently. I mean, like a lot of, a lot of academics are um, sort of deeply worried about bias in algorithms mm -hmm. and um, you know, ethical AI. Um, and you know, some of us have got beyond the, the trolley problem. Like you yeah. know, for many years, the ethics of AI was all about you know, sort of autonomous car is sort of hurtling down a street and has to make two difficult choices between, you know, um, in different variants, sort of killing a certain number of people with some the probability and like one yeah. with, yeah, there's a baby in the stroller version as well. Um, but, you know, I, my, my reaction to that is like, if the car is so smart, how did it get itself into this situation in the first place? Maybe we should sort of build more intelligent cars, but there's, there's sort of a, a, a deeper concern about, um, you know, both uh, understanding the sources of bias, um, but also putting ourselves on a pragmatic path towards um, making sure that the systems are in fact ethical. Because I mean, what you just talked about is one form of like, you know, you're training the data on the wrong sample. I think this is a lot of the facial recognition systems have been trained on biased samples and so are not working as well. But there's also, you know, systems that are going to be naturally trained on biased data because you, because um, some of us generate more data than others, right? I mean, like socioeconomically advantaged people in an era of 5G will generate way more yep. data. And then you've got the reinforcement of biases that existed in the data. You've got the, you know, predictive policing problem where like, you know, you send the police to one particular place and there will be more arrests because like, you know, you can't get arrested without. Yeah. And so it, it, it seems like, you know, once we've sorted out all these different sources of bias, the big challenge to me seems to be how do we, how do we get people to like adopt a responsible code of conduct? And so, I mean, you, you've witnessed a lot of AI implementations. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's going to put us onto the right path? Yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, I, I, frankly, I don't think it's that hard. Uh, but it my, requires... my questions have gotten longer, as you yeah, see. Yeah, no, that, um, I'll try to <laughs> not make my answer too long because I think we can, we can tease it out more and, and get questions yeah. from the audience. I, I frankly don't think it's that hard uh, to do, but I don't. Uh, but organizations aren't simply aren't doing it now. Uh, the the uh, I would say every it, any organization that's deploying AI and doesn't have a, somebody in the C-suite that's accountable for responsible use and, and outcomes from the AI is going to get themselves into serious trouble. It's just a matter of time. Every okay. single company, uh, in my view. And I can give you <clears throat> hundreds of examples of ones who already have. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a new way, of, it's a new code of conduct is the way to think about it that you need to take into account. The trolley problem is a great example. If you're developing products that include AI, the issue with the trolley problem isn't you know, a societal decision on, or a human decision on whether the baby in the stroller is more important than the driver. The issue is the real, the real dilemma of the trolley issue is who gets to make the decision. And as a company, you have to decide, is it a policy or are you leaving an engineer to, to do whatever they want to do in solving yeah. the problem? Issues like the bias in facial recognition are because companies let their engineers figure out what data sets to use to train yeah. facial algorithm, the facial recognition <clears throat> algorithms, and they were massively biased as a result. If people didn't hear the numbers, they could, you could identify white males with uh, 90 plus percent accuracy, African American females less than 65 percent accuracy, because all because it was, it was trained on uh, non diverse data sets. Yeah. Basic problem, no reason it ever should have happened in the first place, other than it was a, it was a delegate, it was a abdication of responsibility, in my view, of those organizations and letting engineers make decisions they shouldn't make. So that's why, you, that's why I believe it's a C-suite issue. It's about governance and accountability, and it's not that hard to solve. Uh, you have to decide who can make what decisions and what's a policy decision versus a technology decision. And so we, we have, um, we've hired a head of responsible AI whose uh, ethics background looking at these issues for us. I believe an organization needs something like that. We have a responsible AI steering committee that includes myself, our general counsel, other senior executives that's focused not just on doing the right things in our organization, but what should we do? Are there projects we shouldn't do because yeah. of the AI implications? Then there's uh, the code. I talked, can talk more about this if you want, but there's what principles do you set? And we have a principle that AI should be fair and AI should be used to reduce bias rather than increase bias is one of our principles. 
And there's ways to do that, um, which gets then into the next layer of what you need to do in companies, which is processes and tools. Yeah. So we have something called the AI Fairness Toolkit, which our teams use, which isn't a silver bullet to eliminate fairness because it's not possible to re eliminate bias. Bias is human, bias is in data. The, ch the question is how do, you get, how do you get things into reasonable tolerance that are consistent yeah. with your policies? And there's ways to do that. And we have an AI Fairness Toolkit that we use in this type of work uh, to do that. So. Um, I guess maybe my answer was longer than I intended, but I, I think there's very pragmatic steps any organization can take to be more responsible in their deployment of AI. Very few are doing it. They're viewing it as a technology issue. Yeah. And by, by virtue of that, they're delegating very serious issues to design or implementation choices by technologists, which isn't the right way to yeah, solve so these problems. It almost seems like you need sort of a set of values or a set of principles right. that permeate themselves into sort of like, you know, the product management and the product yeah, development. Exactly. Let me give you another example. The uh, black box AI is the other thing that, that uh, everybody has, uh, has a lot of debate around in this idea. Well, we'll never be able to explain these algorithms because they're, you know, neural, you know deep learning is in the neural networks is probabilistic. It's hard to explain exactly yeah. what happened. Very true. But that what that means is you better not let Again, you better not let your teams decide where to apply deep learning versus other techniques. There's yeah. techniques you can use to automate things and make informed decisions that are explainable. So if you're doing sentence, criminal sentencing guidelines, if you're doing a termination decisions for an employee, things you want to be able to explain, you should use explainable forms. And again, a policy should be use explainable AI, forms of AI when you need to be able to explain things. And again, not, not enough organizations have a have a, a disciplined policy view like that, yeah. which is one of the things we argue for in the book. Okay, that's, that's, that's really, I mean, we, we could sort of spend the rest of our yeah. session talking about that, but I, I, I do want to get back to this missing middle, because to me, that's, that's sort of one of the core ideas of the book that yeah. makes it interesting and different. Um, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to reading books about automation and the future of work that are sort of either have this you know, machines substitute humans view, or that are excessively futuristic, and you and I have talked about this, that yep. are sort of looking 30 or 40 years ahead and sort of imagining that future, but very few that are talking about the path that is going to be sort of trodden over the next decade. And so, you know, what, what leads you to believe that a core part of, you know, the impact of AI on business is going to be this sort of humans complement AI and machines empower humans. I mean, how do you, yeah. how did you end up there? It seems plausible, but, yeah. you know, for uh, you it seems to be sort of a majority, right, of uh, what, what we'll see AI's impact. Yeah, I'll break down the numbers. <clears throat> so, if, if, so if you look at jobs overall, we believe something like, uh, something ab ab around 90% of jobs of work will be impacted by AI. So most jobs will be impacted in some way. Okay. Uh, if you break it down underneath that, um, we believe, in, and this is a combination of our research, this is also from OECD and a number of others, I'll, I'll cite some others as we go. Uh, we believe about 15 to 20% of jobs will be eliminated. There's jobs that will be eliminated some, some reasonably quickly because of automation through AI. Um, and we believe that's in the 15 to 20 percent range. So what's, the, what's an example of a job that you feel will be eliminated? You know, um, a, a, a easy example is uh, um, one of the areas we're working a lot on in the financial services industry. I'm guessing some of you, financial services industry in the room, yeah. I'm guessing there's a number. Uh, you know, compliance processing, anti-money laundering in banks, using machine learning to better detect patterns. So you need less, uh, you need less uh, compliance roles uh, because you can empower the compliance officers with with uh, better tools to, to okay. enforce the policies. That's, a, that's an easy example. We're, we're working with some, some banks on applying machine learning you know, in, in interesting ways to, to drive efficiency there. So that's, that's an example. Um, uh, the, uh, so 15 to 20% uh, get el eliminated, but about uh, of the remaining jobs, about half get transformed substantially and about half change to some degree. So the thing you really need to, to look at is how do the jobs change? Because the jobs that are eliminated are, they're going away. We need to, we'll come back to that because yeah. we, I believe the grand challenge for <clears throat> the next, for our generation, the next 10 plus years is how do we help the people that are, that are impacted place, in that yeah. way. And uh, I'll come back to that. But the real thing for organizations, what do you do about all those jobs that are transformed that still exist? And uh, how do you prepare your people for the new jobs? Yeah. And the, so what so we believe there's, uh, there's, there's two big categories of new jobs that are created. One where people 
are needed to help AI and help you know, machines, and another where uh, AI helps people okay. do things more effectively. So in the, the category where people are needed to help AI, this is a category of jobs not many people think about. Um, so it's one that we spent a lot of time talking about in the book and following the book, we've spent a lot of time with organizations on. So again, where people are needed to help AI, we, we talk about trainers, explainers, and sustainers, and they kind of all rhyme, which we, we kind of like as authors. Yeah. Uh, trainers, explainers, and sustainers. So an example of a trainer job, again, where people are needed to help AI, isn't the, the tagging, like it's not training an algorithm and data tagging. Uh, an example of a trainer, one of many you know, types of jobs we're seeing is, is a role we're hiring at Accenture, and a number of our clients are hiring, which is training the personality of the virtual agents that are interacting with customers. So we're, you're using, many companies are using uh, different types of technologies, you know, AI chatbots, et cetera, to automate customer interaction. Okay. How do you train, so what's <coughs> happening is, your interaction is now happening um, through, a, you know, through AI, through a, through a virtual agent rather than a person. So your customer's experience of your brand is happening through AI. So what we say in the book is AI becomes your brand, which yeah. we believe is increasingly true. And in, in a five-year period, AI will become your brand and, and, in and many has, companies. And can have huge impact. That's huge AI implications. Is, yeah. So the way, how is your AI differentiated from the brand you compete with? How, how does the AI have the right personality that you want? Is it, a little, you know, is it conservative or is it snarky or yeah. is it going to be the right behaviors? How is it answering the questions and following up? And it turns out that these aren't, you know, these aren't engineering issues. These are human behavioral issues that you need different profiles for. You need sociologists. You need psychologists. We have poetry you know, majors, drama majors. Yeah. Other people are just good at understanding dialogue and human interaction that can help shape the personality and then work with the engineers on tuning the behavior of yeah. the systems in the proper way. And that's a, a job, it's more of a you know, kind of a liberal arts type of job if you want to characterize yeah, it that way than an engineering but, job. But, but it's also sort of a, it's, it's, it's like a brand management job of sorts, right? Because you're, yeah. you're shaping the personality of how people perceive your company. That's right, but, but also a job yeah. that doesn't exist now. It's yeah. kind of an incremental job. And there, there's a lot of jobs like this. And if, if you were back in 1995, and you tried to argue with people that you would have millions of people employed as search engine optimizers, as uh, eBay commerce merchants, as new successful GoDaddy entrepreneurs. You know, you, they, you, people wouldn't have been able to understand what you're talking about. Th yeah. That's the same way. These are the new jobs that are, that are starting to appear. We believe there are millions of jobs. Sustainers is another category where people are needed to help AI, which is, think of this as the HR organization for the AI. Who's, okay. who's managing the AI? Who's diagnosing whether the AI is achieving the right business impact? Who can, who can uh, you know, who's assessing how you improve the AI? So there's a sustainers. And uh, a good example of that, I think, is what Facebook has done post Cambridge Analytica. When Mark Zuckerberg came out and he said, he said, we've concluded AI, you know, algorithms can't police algorithms, was his quote, I think. Yeah. Uh, we decided we need humans to police algorithms, not just for the short term. And uh, they, they're hiring something like 20,000 people that in different categories of job, but we'd say they're all in the sustainer roles, which are overseeing and working with curation around, around algorithms. So that's okay. an example there. And then explainers are another category there, which is people who are explaining the implications of algorithms. So and we're seeing this appear in many companies. So when the Uber car crashed in Tempe, Arizona, uh, last April, a year ago, uh, April, uh, what, how, how did you do the diagnosis? What really happened? was a lot of factors. It wasn't just looking at an algorithm, which the engineers could have done. What was happening? What was the weather? What was the nature of the, 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 the person that, that stepped in the street? How did it happen? And the explainer is a person who can understand the whole uh, context of a situation, the experience, okay. and understand and explain what's happening and then make the improvements you need to. So they may sound like abstract roles, but we're seeing these start to appear at scale in organizations. And again, we believe these are you know, millions and millions of new jobs that are in organizations as they deploy AI. But, but just, just to be clear, the <clears throat> sort of the primary actor here, as far as like, you know, interacting with the customer or doing the work is the AI and sort of the human being is sort of like, you know, shaping it, managing it. Um, in, the, in those cases, those like, are generally know. not engineering yeah. roles, yeah. but there are other roles where you need broader experience of people who understand digital technology and how AI might work. They have okay. some understanding, but they're really uh, providing a, bringing a, a broader set of skills here. So, so that, that, which I think is important because it's saying not everybody needs to be, to be relevant in the age of AI. Not everybody needs to be an AI expert. In fact, I think yeah. the minority of people need to be AI experts. The majority of jobs are going to be in those categories you know, we talked about okay. as we look and at it. And then the second half is... Um... The second half are the people, we, we call it, it's where AI helps people do things in new ways. And this is, these are the ones where people think about more, so they're more intuitive. 
we talk about is AI gives people superpowers. So you know, there's categories, categories of jobs here. So a yeah. uh, simple one is uh, Interact, which we've talked about a little bit. I, I met with a very interesting company here uh, called ASAP. Based, anybody know ASAP? Based in Manhattan, you know ASAP. So interesting organization using AI to automate text and voice interaction. In, in uh, Do you work for ASAP? Okay. <laughs> uh, to um, a very interesting startup here, very well funded, very successful startup working in the tel telco and cable space, yeah. uh, augmenting human operators, uh, understanding text and voice interactions so that they can make it make uh, human operators more efficient. They're like uh, the wingman for the customer service agent, not okay. the eliminator of the customer service agent. So things like they learn from uh, what successful agents do. This is the question the best agents ask, ask next, and they po yeah. pop that up for the agent to ask and a variety of other things, but it's, that's an example of uh, giving the human superpowers and enabling every agent to act with the capability of your best agents, which I yeah. think is very powerful. Yeah, I, I saw a comparable example of that with a Chinese company called VIP Kid, mm. and they're sort of connecting uh, high school teachers in the United States um, to uh, kids in China to teach them English as a second language. So they've got about 100,000 teachers in mostly um, socioeconomically disadvantaged parts of the US and millions of kids in China who are um, sort of in the evening there at 4 a.m. here getting English lessons, English as a second language lessons. And, and there's sort of this constant, they've got this system that is learning constantly and improving the performance of every teacher by yeah. sort of figuring out how like, you know, what techniques from what teachers are getting sort of the best reactions from the students. So, yeah, that's, that, that, great. that's really interesting. Well, just an example, just playing off that one, another one in this interact category, that another application of AI, mm. just, it's, 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 which is fascinating to me, is work we've done for an organization. I think it's called My Second Chance. And it's, for, uh, it's an organization dedica dedicated to helping women in India re-enter the workforce after they've had children. Okay. And the biggest issue with women re-entering the workforce in, in this situation is confidence uh, developing a level of confidence to operate effectively in interviews so that they can get hired. They come, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the confidence level was, was a big factor and the content to be confident. So we developed an AI application that uh, it's, a, it's a virtual coach for women uh, that are re-entering the workforce. Again, this is in India, just in India right now, that uh, uses AI visual, uh, facial uh, uh, analytics, uh, social AI and other things to, under to interview a woman and understand her response and look at and recognize the cues that indicate a lack of confidence. When you answered this question, your body language and your eye contact indicated you were losing confidence. I see. And so you could do it again in practice and, and develop, you know, practice how you project confidence in addition to getting the content you needed. So it's helping you know, women you know, get the jobs they need to re-enter the workforce. And a great example, I think, of helping people be better by, you yeah. know, by using AI and helping women, in this case, get, you know, get jobs. So that's an example. Those are examples of this interact category. Amplify is how do you, you know, take, a, take a person and, and multiply their capability uh, in, in, in powerful ways. And uh, a great example of this that we talk about in the book is, is what's happening in the field of design, uh, product life, PLM, product life cycle management, product design, and uh, the like, where uh, the, the, did any of you work in that field, design, design field? Mm -hmm. The, uh, so it's generative design is the innovation in this field, which is AI-enabled design, generative meaning uh, AI can generate a lot of designs from parameters. So the designer, uh, you still have a designers, you still have the same number of designers, but their, their productivity and their creativity is multiplied. And if you talk to the designers who use these tools, they, they love them. And okay. actually, one of the designers used, used Autodesk's uh, uh, Dreamcatcher to design an award-winning chair called the Elbow Chair. They talked about their experience and said they, they would have never come up with, a ch with this design without the generative design technology because uh, it goes through an iterative creative process where it, 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 it leads you to ideas you might not have thought about before. And the designer is still making the decisions due to the curation and getting the, you know, getting the design at the end of the day, but you know, really coming out with a phenomenal, uh, more effective yeah, you know, and more creative design. Because that's the nature of the example that you sort of do here, I mean, at least that people imagine, right? Mm -hmm. That like, you know, where will AI create jobs? Well, the, um, the person in the community who's not actually a skilled doctor will be able to sort of offer medical advice with the yeah. medical AI. The, you won't need professors anymore because like, you know, anybody who communicates well can then be complimented with the AI. Well, well and, the virtual or Yeah. Okay. And, and, and you know, I'm, you know, I, I often think of, um, 
you know, to, to me, one of the most fascinating AI implementations that we have is Waze, and I know you use it in your book, but I've, I've always, I feel it's like magic, right? Yeah, I mean, everything that they promised me about AI 25 years ago, this thing does. One of my first jobs as a grad student was a prologue programmer, so I'm, and I had to use Psych, the mm -hmm. common sense ontology, and, you know, it, it, I, I felt like, um, you know, I, I rejected neural networks as like, you know, oh, these things can't really do much. Uh, what did I know, right? I mean, but <laughs> I guess the computers weren't powerful enough to sort yeah. of give them the power. Yep. But I see uh, Uber and Lyft drivers every day in some ways falling into that second category because, um, you know, they can come in and sort of pursue work in a city that they have little or no familiarity with, where they are doing sort of part of the job, but then this really powerful AI um, is facilitating them being able to sort of navigate. It's telling them exactly what to do. They're doing it. I mean, on the one hand, that's worrying because it's sort of setting them up for automation down yeah. the road. But I mean, I, I think once you sort of look at the world through your frame, you start to notice that there are more contemporary examples of this sort of human AI complementary. I mean, how many of you feel like there's some artificial intelligence related system that is helping you every day in work or that sort of complements what you do at work. How many of you drive to work? Okay, so this is a bad question to ask about <laughs> Manhattan or how many of you take an Uber to work? We're in Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah, because that but but it's it's a uh, I mean I mean this is this is really one of the best parts of the book because um there's I mean we it, it moves us from sort of this imagined future of job creation to actually sort of making it tangible. And it, yeah. I feel like it sort of lays out two different things that I'm gonna ask you about now. One is um, sort of a blue, some, something resembling a blueprint for what are the skills that we need to give people. I mean, like, you know, both mid-career, but also like, you know, for us in a university, like, you know, what should we train our students for to sort of mm -hmm. prepare them for this new world? But it also starts to sort of give managers more pragmatic um, guides to um, like, you know, making sense of how AI is going to impact that business. So I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on the first thing for sure, um, which is, yeah, because um, I, I, I talk to um, sort of senior HR executives a lot as part of like, you know, imagining the future of work. And they all seem to understand that reskilling or um, that some of the people who work for them, a significant fraction, are going to have to upgrade their skills. Mm -hmm. um, they also understand that many of these people are gonna have to transition out, um, but they're frustrated by, they read the reports and the reports say like, you know, data scientist is a job of the future or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of machine, like, you know, te technological roles. Right. And, and they're sort of frustrated because they're like, we can't teach everybody to be a Python programmer or to sort of like, you know, learn R or to, you know, take machine learning courses. And so even though they have an intent to transition, they don't really know what to sort of imbue people with. And so can you sort of talk a bit to like, what are the things that contemporary employ? I mean, like, let's start with sort of people mid-career right now who need to be transitioned. I mean, what, what should we, we be skilling them for? Yeah, I think the... I'll give you a general answer, then I'll give you an example. I think the, the key thing is, and first of all, I don't have the, the exact crystal ball on this. I think this is the big issue, is exactly what do we train people on, but I'll, I'll tell you what our current thinking is. The, um, uh, the uh, general thing we, you need is digital. People have to have a base foundation of digital skills to be effective in, okay. this, in this world. And in, 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 in there's professions right now where people it will be displaced from purely physical roles, and those will be the people that are challenged that we really have to help with that. And I can, we're doing a lot of work. I can give you some examples of how we're helping uh, people in a lot, of, a lot of ways with that uh, if we want to get into it. But the, the kinds of things, it's digital skills, and then it's, it's, it's the, the other thing you need to do is amp, look at how you amplify or how you better utilize people's human skills. The skills we don't think will be replaced for the next, for, for decades, are complex problem solving, cross-domain, you know, really complex problem solving, creativity in any profound way. We can get into that. There's a debate around that, but I don't believe true creativity will be replaced anytime soon. It'll be augmented, as we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, sensory perception, which is sensing and reacting quickly to the world around us, and uh, social-emotional response, which is the, the personal interaction. Those are the, four, those are the four human skills that are best to double down on 
And, and, and if you look at those categories that Jobs went through earlier, it's kind of looking at how do you, how do you, um, you know, utilize those human capabilities and then, and then use AI around them. So let me give you a specific example of this that I think is, it brings it to life. There's work we did for one of the, we're still doing for one of the large energy companies. Think uh, drilling, oil field services. So yeah. Like you're drilling, you're doing the messy work of uh, putting in the pipes, pipe segments to drill. That's been a business that historically has been uh, about valves. You know, turn the valve, you need more water or increase the pace uh, of the, 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 the torsion in the drill and as, it's, as it's drilling. Very physical job. And uh, you, what happened is you did your best to guess what was happening underground, and then something broke in some point, and you'd pull yeah. it all back out and figure out what happened, and you'd look at a bunch of spreadsheets. Um, well, now what you can do is you can put sensors on the drill bit so you, ha you know exactly what's happening underground. So it changes what the drill operator needs to do. <clears throat> the drill operator still needs to do all those physical things. But now the drill operator is doing something different. Instead of guessing what's happening and waiting for something to break, He's seeing a visualization that's actually built with a gaming engine. It's built on Unity, which is a gaming platform. So that oil field service technician needs to use this gaming platform where the, it's actually a visualization of what's happening based on the sensor data. I you see. can see, you okay. can see the, by color coding the torque, the tension, uh, the, the resistance, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the fluid density, et cetera, everything you need to understand. So you can control and adjust the drill and steer the drill horizontal, whatever you need to do to operate it more effectively. Uh, and what's happened is the, the physical oil field services technicians have been trained, have learned, and are, are using this new technology okay. to operate drills. So, so think, think about what's, what's happened there. So somebody with no digital skills is now, is now playing a game to operate the drills, still needing to do their, intersperse it with their physical work. So you have a, a gaming engine powered, digital skills literate, physically capable oil field services engineer. That's okay. literally that would be the job title yeah. if you wrote it. And so what's the important lesson that to learn? Make, make a lot of people happy, right? I mean, who Well, are, the lesson um, to learn out of that is, is... Playing games late at night instead of doing their homework. Right, like playing games, yeah, we'll come back. Preparing for that. the future of work. Gaming does yeah. have a lot of redeeming... <clears throat> we yeah. can talk about that too. Gaming does have a lot of redeeming benefits in this yeah, future yeah. world. But so the, the big message to companies in this, and we're seeing this generalized across many jobs in many industries, is think about the, that company now. What, what, how are you going to develop that skill? If your approach to the workforce is fire my physical work, oil field services workers because I need these digital workers, and then you go to market and try to hire a gaming engine enabled digital literate uh, uh, you know, oil field services technician, there aren't any. Yeah. The, the people don't exist. So unless you invest in your own people, the roles are changing so profoundly and at such a rate that if you don't develop the capa your own capability to move your own people ahead, you'll be stuck. So the reason I go through that example is in, in this world, with the, the, as you look at the human skills you need, uh, companies need to invest in, in, in developing those, those new roles or you'll be stuck. Your competitors who invest more in learning uh, and bringing people along are the ones who are going to succeed. And this is not a one-time change. These jobs are going to continue to change over the next, over the next decade. So the, uh, from the survey we did in the book, 65% of organizations, 65% of these 1,500 executives agreed with that. 65% of organizations said our workers aren't ready for AI and these changes that are coming, yeah. uh, 60, which is probably about right. We then asked, how many of you are training your people to get them ready? Any, mm -hmm. Anyone want to guess how many? 10, 5, go lower, 3. 3% 3 of, of, wow. of executives said they're training their people. And, and, Part of that may have been a time issue that was two, a couple of years ago, but I think it was more an issue of companies not knowing what to do. I don't think they're evil in saying we don't want to invest in people either. Yeah. I, companies just don't know what to do, and the message, we're, that's why we're trying to bring some clarity to this and say the only route through this is to, is to understand your human skills and invest in your own human talent and develop your learning platform now and view it as lifelong learning and your ability to continue to move people along because that, that oil field services technician that's using that technology I just described is going to be doing something different two years from now and five years from now. And you need to keep helping that individual succeed if you want to be viable at your, your business. Yeah, so it seems like early in your career, I mean, I, I want to go to Q&A because we're about 40 minutes in, but it also seems to me that you're, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep talking first because I can. <laughs> you know, this is a, we, we get spoiled as professors um, that, you know, learning how to learn seems to be sort of an important yeah. early, early career skill to pick up, right? I mean, you can't just learn and then, and then move on. Yeah. Well, I think the issue in the world we're moving into is I, th I think people who want to learn, 
I think are going to be okay in this new world. Yeah. If we can find, the, if, if companies do the right thing, if we have the right government, there's a, whole, a lot of work we're doing in, in Washington and in other governments around the world on what we, the governments need to do. We can get into that too if you're interested. But if, if we do the right thing societally across public and private sector, I think we can put the right mechanisms in place. And the people who want to learn, I think we can give the right mechanisms to to be successful. If there's people who don't want to learn or don't view themselves as needing to learn, that's what, what I worry about. And those are going to, that's going to could create a really left behind generation. So the question is, what yeah. do we, how do we instill the desire to learn in people? Because the people who don't want to learn in this environment we're moving into are, are already in trouble and are going to be increasingly yeah, this is in a trouble question going I forward. deal with every day. How do I inspire and <laughs> instill in people a desire You're to learn? You're in an environment where people but, yeah. generally want to learn. So it's I know, a, but, but so I, I feel like that really is one of the biggest public policy challenges of the next couple of decades, right? Because mm -hmm. we've got these fantastic institutions for early career learning. We've created this complex product of the undergrad degree and the MBA yeah. and so on, but we don't have a comparable set of institutions for mid-career transition that gives people the package, not just sort of... Yeah, like, that's know, right. Sort of one thing I'll just, since you mentioned that point, the one other thing I'll mention is uh, one of our strategic errors in the book is we put something back on page... Uh, on page like 250, 253, I think. Um, where we say that uh, all the proceeds of the book are being donated to nonprofits who are around the world who are focused on mid-career reskilling, because that that is the issue. We, uh, there's a lot of these problems that I think we'll we'll solve and we can put a lot of attention on. Mm -hmm. Mid-career reskilling is is the the big challenge that could really create a lot of political instability and a lot of other big yeah. problems. Not to mention the human tragedy of people you know, being stuck. Yeah in the middle of their careers. So all the proceeds of the book, uh, it's in four languages coming out in five more, and the book's doing pretty well. And uh, we just this week had a call to donate our first year's proceeds to, it was really exciting to look at organizations who are doing great work in the US and around the world to, to, to help those mid-career people. Yeah. But there's a lot more money that needs to go into it. So we're, right. that's what we're, we're doing that's with amazing. the proceeds. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, we're about a little over 40 minutes in, and so um, we're going to sort of open it up for questions. Um, now, uh, Paul has brought five copies of his book. Yep. And uh, we've decided that the first five good questions that we get will... <clears throat> so I'll, I'll, I'll take the question, and then Paul will judge whether the no, question no, no, is good. You know, that wasn't what we agreed. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, let's see. Let's, let's start uh, on the right here. Yeah. The gentleman in the, in the tie. Yeah, that's... Was, like it be, very, was it because he has a tie that you picked him? Yeah, it's sort of, I, I, I'm sort of there's, there's bias oh, here. Uh, yeah. I didn't even ask the question. Yeah. Well, oh, that's why we have to evaluate. This. There better yeah, be a good question. Okay, since yeah, we, so we, uh, we'll take it back if it's not <laughs> okay. good. You know? We'll wrestle it back from you. <laughs> um, can, can you comment on machine learning on a global basis, in particular what you see happening in countries in Asia, such as China, and your comments about that? Yeah, I'm interested in what, uh, what Arun has to say about that in, uh, as well. Um, so uh, uh, Kai-Fu Lee, well, first of all, I'd recommend Kai-Fu Lee's book, if those of you, if, are you aware of Kai-Fu Lee? It's a, it's a book called uh, AI Superpowers. AI Superpowers is Kai-Fu's book. It's fantastic. It came out a little bit after our, our book, and we've done a lot of events together. And he talks specifically and in detail about China and the US and Europe and what's happening. So I'd recommend that to for a real thorough answer to the question, and my view is generally aligned with his, although he's he's maybe a little he's maybe a little bit more extreme than, than my view. So what I would say is China is clearly making amazing advances in AI. Uh, they're doing it because they have a concerted policy through their five-year plan to do it. It's a case where coordinated planning helps because you can have government investment, uh, government uh, uh, policies around data. Uh, combined with private sector action that has a real difference, combined with the educational work they're doing at uh, Tsinghua and other outstanding universities. So China is going like this in AI. You can measure it in terms of investment going into China. More AI investment went into China than, than, any other than the US or any other country uh, in the past year. You can measure it in terms of citations. The citations of the papers published as well as citations are increasing dramatically in China. So the quality of the research is better. You can look at the AI that's, uh, that's in platforms like uh, Tencent and Alibaba and such and the, that they're developing and it's outstanding. You can look at the quality of startups uh, that are coming out and there's some very high quality startups. So China's uh, making a very fast, very fast progress on their stated goal to be the leading AI uh, economy and leading AI country 
by, I forget the year exactly, I think it was uh, 2028 or 2026. So I think they're on a good path for that. So a, the US is ahead in terms of those say, the, the, most, most of those measures. I think the technology still would be a, ahead in the US. The research, et, et cetera, would be, would be uh, and citations and such uh, would be a, ahead in, you know, in terms of quality of research and such. But the question is what happens, what happens from here? And, uh, and I think the reality is we'll have both countries with amazing AI capability. And I'll talk about Europe in a minute. And my hope is that we don't have a lot of trade protections and competitive considerations come into play because we're going to develop great AI capability in a number of spots in the world. The risk is if it gets politicized and weaponized and uh, in, in different ways, not just weaponized in terms of weapons, but uh, competitively and economically. And I think that'll be very, you know, very challenging. So we're an advocate, uh, and I'm an advocate for keeping the flow of information and research and everything else very open, which it still is today. But there's different forces, as you know, from US and China and other countries who, who are uh, voicing different views on that. So I think advocating for continuing open flow of intellectual property and research and everything else is, and, and, the te and the technology is critical. Europe, I'll just make one comment on, because every time I go to Europe, I, I do a discussion like this, or I attend a panel, and everybody's all sad. And, <laughs> and the, quite, the first question is, is typically, rather than, you know, what's, what, what's your book about? The first question is typically, you know, uh, uh, now that we've lost, now that Europe's lost in AI, what do we do next? <laughs> uh, I see. And I think that's the wrong view, because I don't think AI has, uh, or I don't think Europe's lost at all. There's, the, if you look at Germany, and you know, Jan LeCun was educated in France, even though he's here yeah. at NYU now. Uh, and uh, great research in France at many institutions, great, some of the world leading research in Germany at a uh, number of institutions, Switzerland and other places, the UK as well. Uh, and um, it's a great academic research. The issue has been more the economical advantage of startups and scaling tech companies in, yep. in Europe. But I, I think that's fighting last year's or last decade's battle. I think the question shouldn't be framed as how do I create the next Google of AI? That's the, that still, still seems to be what Europe's asking. I think the question should be, how do we, how do we become, how do we be, uh, dominate industrial application of AI in the industries we're good at? In aerospace, in life sciences, in manufacturing, in the Mittelstand in Germany, how do you, how do you develop an excellence in AI so that your industries are more competitive than anybody, anywhere else in the industry? You know, large scale implementation of AI in China, the US and other places isn't gonna impact Europe's ability to be competitive at that if they really focus on it. So we can talk more about that, but I think the, the view of, the, of Europe as having no chance, I think, is a, a limited view and may be true in fields of computer vision, vision and natural language processing and things that have been do, defined by large-scale investment and application of data, but there's many, there's thousands and thousands of other very important problems to be solved that, that any country in the world can, you know, can have a say in. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, I'll just add two quick points. One is that, um, <clears throat> I mean, there's no doubt that China is ahead in the implementation of AI, um, in, in, in part because um, the sets of data about human activity that are digitally available are just so much more immense in China because of the merging of online and offline that is sort of so much further ahead. And I think the appetite to experiment, and this sort of goes to one of your earlier points about sort of letting deep learning loose on things responsibly, I think that there's actually a much greater willingness to simply, you know, implement. And, um, you know, while that may not be best for society in the long run, it certainly sort of generates more learning, which then sort of like, you know, feeds into itself. And so it's sort of a, it's a tough thing to fight in this, this sort of the trade-off between competitive advantage and um, ethical behavior is going to become one that is sort yeah. of a signature of the US and China. But I'm not as optimistic as you about the rest of the world. I sort of do feel that the US and China will sort of grow disproportionate to the rest of the world and will probably sort of suck a lot of value out of the rest of the countries as, as we go down this path. But I hope I'm proved wrong. Yes, sir. The other gentleman in the tie. Yeah. <laughs> the, the ties what, are winning. What is your, what, what's the civic can, and governmental role for companies that benefit from, a, from AI and then have, in effect, a disproportionately negative impact. I'm thinking of, I, I buy a lot of stuff from Amazon, but that's closing down malls. I buy a lot of stuff, I look at a lot of things at, on Netflix, so I don't go to the movies so much anymore. So all of these AI applications, because I think of all of these new 
companies or relatively new companies as a form of AI. They have, they, they're uh, providing great services, but on the other hand, they're having a negative impact on certain parts of the economy. So if I'm a business guy, all I care about is my bottom line. Who stands up for society's overall interests and maybe the interests of the, the people who have been, you know, sort of disrupted? Yeah, you know, there's two things there. Is one one question is um, uh, is what society's role, and the other question is who is society in in, in this case. So, so I, I think there is. So I'll answer the first first one first. So, so what is society's role? So, gov government. We we've, we've been advocating for four you know, with any government around the world, but we're spending a lot of time on this in the U.S. in particular. There's four roles of of government that you know, we believe the government needs to step in and. Um, step up its uh, involvement in with respect to AI. The first is in kind of a national plan and vision around AI and the R&D to support it. The second is around a workforce strategy for AI for all the reasons we've been talking about. The third is a data policy for AI because without a data policy, I, th we think it, I don't think any country will be successful in AI. And the fourth is, um, is around responsible AI, which starts getting into some of the, the things you're talking about. So government does have a role to play in you know, setting boundaries of, of kind of responsible <clears throat> behavior around AI and some of the things we're talking about. I think the challenge in some of the examples you bring up, though, is who decides what, what's good. Um, you know, in spite of all the, 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 the debate now about, use Facebook as an example, about the way Facebook's using data and what's happened to Cambridge Analytica and what's happening in news feeds and everything else, uh, not many people are stopping using Facebook. People have decided that this, this uh, value equation of free social media is just fine with them, and they're okay with it. So should government step in and change that when people are voting, uh, voting with their behavior? The same is true of Amazon. People, are, people love the convenience, and they love the cheaper products, and that's how they're voting. Before Amazon, the debate was Walmart. Walmart's shutting down the local hardware stores. So, so I think, that's, um, I think the, the real issue is what, a, what do we want as consumers in society more so than... than or what we want as, as consumers, and are we going to change our behavior? And uh, I think uh, that I don't see a lot of promise <laughs> that 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 that'll that that'll change anytime soon. And uh, so, so I think that's uh, what we need to. I think <clears throat> what will change a little bit is that there is a changing view, at least on the value of privacy and personal information. I think people are starting to take a different view of that, and I think that's a positive thing. We're uh, we've, we've written uh, a policy uh, or a position advocating a federal level privacy standard that uh, would allow uh, consumers uh, to control their own personal information, which is different than the, U the way U.S. operates today. I believe that's important, and we believe that's important, which is why we're advocating for that at a federal level. That starts to establish some of these societal principles, but it gets, it gets tough when you get into, like, should Amazon be able to sell at scale like they do? Because I think consumers... Tend to, tend to vote with their wallets on these things and have shown that they support those types of models. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean one hopes that much like, um, you know, so something akin to sort of a, a green company or a sort of, a, sort of like, you know, the, um, the advantages that, or the progressive sort of growth of sort of consumers voting for companies whose values they support. Right. I mean, that doesn't scale easily, but it's... it's, it's well, I think, I think what's going to happen, I think transparency yeah. is increasing, though, and I think the yeah. more the transparency is, the problem is, if, so to answer on Amazon, would people change their behavior if they had transparency into the carbon footprint, the locally displaced jobs and everything, whatever might be yeah. a result of the model? Um, then maybe they would, but I think the issue is how do you, how do you get real-time transparency to the impact of your decisions. And that, that'll improve over time as, as, we, as yeah. we can use technology more effectively. All right, questions? Uh, yes. <clears throat> so with the focus being on lifelong learning, um, how will that impact, thank you, um, how will that impact education? Um, so specifically, uh, graduate programs, PhD programs at incredible institutions like NYU Stern. It's a terrible question. We should take back your book. <laughs> um, no, that's a, that's a very good question. I, I, uh, I'd be interested in, in your view as, as an educator. I was with, a, I won't mention the institution, I was with the dean of another very esteemed uh, engineering institution in this case. And, uh, and he was a, it was a private meeting, not, not just me and him, but it was a, a private off-the-record meeting. And he, he, uh, he, was chat, he was questioning whether a four-year degree was viable in the, in the world we're moving into. Um, and I... I Agree with that, but I think there. I think it still is, but I think it needs to be different. Um, I think the, in the lifelong learning, there's there's um, 
we're, we're doing a lot of work down apprenticeships. We've got a pilot program in St. Louis taking people who have no digital skills, uh, kind of subsidizing their learning process for a year to try to, so, to see if we can have them come out at the end with not turning them to machine learning researchers, but just giving them viable skills for the new economy. And that's showing a lot of progress. That's a public-private partnership that we and other companies are involved with with the city of St. Louis. And that's and it's apprenticeships combined with some subsidization of people to help them through the process. That's a good example. We need that, you know, that we need a lot of shared investment, public-private investment to do that. I think the, we, we need to look at allocation of, of educational assistance. Uh, right now, our educational assistance is targeted more at uh, university in, entry to, to workforce. It takes something like Pell Grants, which are billions of dollars, should we spread more of those over lifelong learning at different points in people's career rather than uh, workforce entry? I think we probably should. I mean, it's a policy thing that, that, that is being looked at in that case in the federal government. Um, there's tax incentives that I've, I've talked about publicly before and that I've been advocating. Right now, uh, which, which it gets into how you afford the education, uh, right now, uh, companies are incented for investing in equipment, in capital plant and equipment. If any of you study accounting or work in business, that's, you can depreciate it. Uh, you have to expense training. What would happen if you could depreciate, if, uh, if you could depreciate training? How would that change the profile <coughs> and investment that we make in people? So that's a, another change. Mm -hmm. What's that? Uh, but for depreciation experience, so it depends on your incentive. Yes, right. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, so there's there's different incentives like that that we need to that we need to look at. So I think it's restructured a lot. I think there's a bigger role for community colleges in, in as, a, as a different uh, form of training and education. And there's some some work that's going on uh, with community colleges there as well. I, I worry less about the K through 12. We're supporting we're through, we support code.org and a lot of all sorts of organizations in the K through 12 space. And there's a lot of focus there. We've got a lot of broken is, you know, issues with our education system. But I, it, it feels like we're doing a lot of things to move that population along. I think it's that later stage that I worry about more than yeah, we do so solutions I, for. I couldn't agree more. I think that there will be more, um, like we're going to feel greater pressure to um, sort of think about uh, reimagining our model as a lifelong learning model. not not without sort of an upfront investment, like, you know, like, you know, but that may not be four years, it may be a little shorter. Um, larger number of shorter degree programs are likely to happen. I mean, like, you know, we've certainly like, you know, and uh, sort of uh, our, our Dean J.P. Eggers has sort of been leading the charge there on sort of creating new sort of shorter one year focused degree yeah. programs. That's certainly part of the future, but I agree completely, like, you know, sort of mid-career transition that scales. I think the community colleges were set up in the 60s in part because of worries of automation, like when yeah. JFK set them mm -hmm. up. So I, I don't think that they fulfilled their promise of being the institutions for transition, but they're certainly sort of at least the sort of like, you know, the physical world infrastructure for that. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're going to get exactly five questions. <laughs> I mean, like after the fifth question, they're going to be like, yeah, whatever, right? So all the way in the back there, so that I'm not favoring people who are sitting in the front. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, uh, with the things that you've seen and the impl implementation attempts that you've seen, what are the tasks or domains where you're most concerned about implementing AI? So the example that comes to mind for me is Amazon and their tool for hiring being biased against women, and then they scraped it. Um, where should we be most alarmed or most wary when it comes to implementing these technologies? Yeah, the, um, uh, I'll give you two. When it, in the business context, I think it's, um, uh, yeah, I, it, 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 you mentioned a good one with the Amazon and AI. That we should be concerned about that, but I think we'll, you know, to Amazon's credit, Amazon's one of the most uh, sophisticated organizations that using AI. The first Amazon browser, you know, back way, way back when, with the 1997 or whatever it was, had a, you know, machine learning and the recommendation engine behind the very first version of it. So they're, they're one of the longest using companies with it, and they're very sophisticated. They're great at it. So the fact that they can even stumble into problems is what scares me, because there's so many organizations who are less sophisticated uh, to, you know, using it in different ways. So I, I think it's, it's those data issues that I, that I worry about. I mean, humans are biased. So any human data we've collected re reflects biases or demographic, di di demographic differences. I think the things we have to be very careful about are, are um, uh, things that, that uh, decisions that involve people's access, so like the lending 
thing I mentioned is, a, is, a, is something that I've, decisions like that are is something I'm worried about. We're using AI, we're, we're developing AI in a lot of um, embedded technologies. We're doing you know, medical devices um, that have learning capability built in in different ways, uh, manufacturing environments that are using uh, process controls increasingly using you know, not just you know, traditional technology, but AI and machine learning and, and that. And, and the implications of wrong decisions are much more profound. So the, you have to be much more careful around the guardrails you put around the systems and the, the way they operate. So I think uh, more care just needs to be taken depending on the risk of the, the processes that you're, that you're looking at. The, the broader concern I have and a big risk area that I think we need to be concerned about as a society is, uh, is the way it can be militarized. Uh, so this gets yeah. into autonomous lethal weapons. And um, <clears throat> there's been a, a lot of work done on this. Uh, Stuart Russell at Berkeley has led a, and others have led a, a lot yeah, of- Wendell Wallach. At Wendell Yale. Wallach, and yeah. yeah. And uh, great work on building awareness around it, but there hasn't been enough action on it yet. And I think the, that's something that, that could have a lot of implications very quickly if we don't get our arms around kind of arms is the wrong word, but we don't get uh, some policy around controlling the spread of, 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 uh, of autonomous and use of autonomous weapons. There are, even the US has a policy on, on authorizing use of autonomous lethal weapons in certain parts of the world. Um, and, uh, and so it's something we need to be very careful about as a society. Yeah, it's a scary one, because I mean, the UN has a group and they're sort of trying to learn, the UN has a group to sort of try and think about what are the mechanisms by which we can um, slow or stop the proliferation of sort of lethal autonomous weapons. And, you know, the examples that they have to draw from, say, nuclear power, where, um, like, you know, are, um, are only partial because, you know, there was a very different kind of, like, you know, detectable signature. Yeah. Um, there was a different kind of technological curve that you had to sort of jump over. There was the ability to constrain supply of critical resources, none of which seem to apply here. So it, it is a very, you know, I... I sometimes feel that's one of those problems where sometimes we ignore problems that are too enormous for us to sort of comprehend the solutions of. And I sort of figure like climate change, this may be one of them. So yeah. um, we have a fifth question, which I'm going to let you call on because I don't want to sort of be the person for the last, to... For the last one. We'll go back yeah. to this side. You've had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. So I, I graduated from Stern about 20 years ago. The, uh, the gentleman to my right had mentioned something about the bottom line, and I guess I've been close enough to the center of power at big companies and little companies to appreciate how difficult it is to make the quarter with Stern grads, HBS grads, Columbia grads, who want to learn, who've got kids in private school who need to stay, and they're incented and they can barely get their jobs done. And if you knew how close some of these big publicly traded companies are to missing their quarter when they don't, you'd think, Jesus, how are these folk <laughs> in the C-suite going to yeah. take half of their workforce and help them augment AI or vice versa as trainers, as sustainers, and what was the third? Explainers. Explainers. <laughs> when the companies themselves need these folks to do it for them so that they can actually create some sort of learning environment for the companies themselves. So it's almost like there's a macrocosmic problem. And then equally, and, and this, Arun, you'd be very helpful for, is how does Wall Street, which, you know, has a couple of metrics, which, you know, quarter in, quarter out, year in, year out, they use to value a company and they've been very resistant to use anything else than the metrics, KPIs, et cetera, that they use. Now the, um, I don't know, it's almost like a proclivity to learning, preparing for the future, AI readiness. What sort of metrics will Wall Street use to be able to assess a company for its long-term viability when it too judges by the quarter and nothing more? Hmm. And rewards, essentially, as well. Do you have a... Do you have a I'll, I'll, I'll let you start. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thought he was, it's your event. thought I was going to dish that one off. If you give me another book, I'll just go home and we can pretend <laughs> I didn't Bad question. Ask. We need the book back. <laughs> no, the, uh, on the workforce, there's two parts, I think, there. One is the workforce. One is the kind of Wall Street measurement. On the workforce point, you're right. Let's, it, it's not like it can take 20,000 people out of your workforce and set them aside for a while and, and, and meet the business. So this is about how do you... Yeah, it's, um, 
it's looking at uh, uh, point in time training, the right moments to do it, et cetera. There's, uh, it, that's, it's, that's why we, we talk about these lifelong learning platforms and learning platforms that are accessible at, at the point when you need them. And I think that's what it's going to need to be so you help people learn uh, as they're doing their job. An example is uh, you know, the, the company I mentioned earlier, ASAP, which is working with these call center agents. They're not pulling them out and training them to use, use this new technology. It's a new interface they're using that's incrementally training them every call. They're learning something a little bit new, and so they're still doing things they were doing, but they're, they're getting better at it as, as time goes on. So I think generally speaking, that's going to need to be the approach because I don't think companies can, can take you know, significant bodies of their workers out of the workforce just, just for a training purpose. But I think, that's, I think that's doable if you approach it the right way. The, on the measurement thing, um, I, don't, I don't think they'll ever be able to. I think other than uh, maybe the way they look at discounting the company's future prospects based on whether yeah. they're prepared or not, I don't know how you reduce it to a set of, of metrics. I don't have a good answer yeah, to I mean, that. One, one promising direction could be, I mean, and, and this, is, this is sort of still in the, in the design stage. I mean, there's nothing close to implementation. But if you think about um, ways in which companies have collectively decided, some companies have collectively decided that they are going to signal their environmental responsibility. Um, <clears throat> this is, um, you know, there's, there are metrics that have now emerged through sort of industry consortia that give us some information about this. And so I've spoken to a lot of large companies about them somehow sort of inducing the same, trying to induce the same positive perceptions of companies that are being particularly responsible about workforce transition. Um, and to use this as a way, because I mean, these companies often sort of suffer from not having, like, you know, to be able to sort of harness the kinds of resources that they need to successfully sort of accomplish this. And so if you've got something akin to sort of like, you know, being environmentally responsible or like, you know, sort of running a sustainable business and, you know, having industry consortia that then sort of start to rate companies based on that. And this becomes sort of a signal of quality, something that you want to advertise, uh, something that you're proud of, then I think that, that that's one mechanism by which we can start to sort of see some information about it. But I think we're a few years away from it. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of, um, it's going to be a hard one to get to. Um, so let, let's do this. I mean, we've got, uh, we're running a little over, but there are more questions. So why don't we take three questions, one after the other, and I'll sort of write them down. And, um, and then I'll read them back to you, and you can answer any or all of them. And then like, okay. you know, there's, there's lots of alcohol in the back that, um, you know. And there are also, um, there's a bookseller in the back who probably hates us right now for you know, giving away free books. Um, <clears throat> but anybody who asks a question, who wants a book, um, who forgot to bring their credit card with them, um, just sort of go and take a book, give him my name, and I'll tell him. And like you know, I'm happy to contribute um, to you having this book because of where the proceeds are going, and I'm very happy to sort of contribute to that. So um, you know, there are more copies of the book available in the back, and lots of different ways to get them. But let's sort of take three questions, answer them, and then you know, sort of go to the more informal part. Um, yes, sir. You've had your hand up for a while as well. Yes. Yeah. Oh. So uh, my question is about universal basic income. I mean, we talked ah. about future of work, yeah. uh, reskilling. Where does that fit in all of this? OK, great. great one. Short and sweet, UBI, um, all the way in the back right corner. How is Accenture applying mm -hmm. some of these uh, concepts to how you run your operations, how you run your marketing? How are you applying it internally rather than how you're advising your customers? Yep. OK. And um, all right, final question up here. So. Sorry, I favored this. I'll take one from this side as well. Uh, my question. question's around trust and how are, how, what's the plan to build and manage trust between the trainers, um, explainers, sustainers, and, and the AI uh, machine employees? What a great set of questions. Okay. Yeah, and we'll take one more good. from this side since I didn't favor it. Okay, uh, yes, the woman in the back. <clears throat> Hi, I'm curious about when you're making the business case to the C-suite, what's most effective for them to adopt AI? What works well? What was, what, what? A when C-suite. You, a C-suite, yeah. making the business case, what works well? OK. OK, so we've got Oof. UBI. Wow. What do you think of UBI? How is Accenture applying 
um, the principles that you've developed or like, you know, sort of the stuff that you guys are doing around AI implementations internally? Um, how do we build trust between the human yeah. AI interface in general? And uh, how do you make the case for AI to like, you know, top management? Yeah, great question. I'll do like, I'll answer them real quick. I don't think you want long answers to each. So I'll just give a yeah. quick answer. We can pick it up over a drink more. So the UBI question is, is a great one. I almost went there earlier and just, and just didn't because I don't want to make the answer longer. I generally am skeptical of, of UBI because of the word <clears throat> universal. Uh, I think we need targeted for that 15 to 20% I talked about earlier that are going to be out of work and really have a challenge to, like the people in St. Louis that we're helping, there's people who are going to need significant assistance, and I think we need new societal mechanism and investment to help those people. The idea of giving every American $1,000 a month, which is Andrew Yang's platform, I think is, it's too broad, and I don't think it produces the desired, uh, desired results. So uh, Finland, there's countries that are testing universal basic income. I, I personally think it needs to be more focused and targeted, but we do need more, much, probably much more assistance quickly to help the, the people who need it. So that's the answer on that one. On the, um, what was next? The, uh, uh, how is Accenture applying? Uh, is Accenture, yeah, we're, we're, we're applying it aggressively because look, we're, we're almost a 500,000 person organization. So if, if AI is gonna impact how people work, it's gonna impact us more than anybody else. So we've been uh, aggressive at applying it in every part of our business we can. So one area of our business, for example, um, in our operations business, we employ 100,000 people. And we, we actually talked to our employees and we said to every one of them, we said, help us figure out what we can automate and we'll help you, you know, we'll help you figure out how to do your, a, a better job. And uh, so we've automated in the three years we've been at that, I think the number is now 37,000 of the 100,000 jobs uh, using uh, AI, nanobots and a lot of other RPA, number of other technologies. All those people are still employed and our business has grown because we've been able to up level everybody from you know, say mortgage loan data validation to uh, mortgage analysis for you know for our, our clients who use that service as an example. So that's uh, so we're applying it as aggressively as we can. We believe the future of consulting. If you think of consulting as you know, spread, spreadsheets and PowerPoint, that's dead. You know, spread uh, consulting is about AI and models and data and real time a real time iterative analysis. So it's, we're transforming our consulting business to operate a very different way. Uh, so we're applying it aggressively in every part of our business because we think it impacts our kind of industry faster than others. Yeah, trust between trust. the humans and the machines. I'll, I'll end on trust because that's, okay. I, I love that uh, question. Like, um, and then the, the C-suite. The business case for AI. It's really hard <laughs> um, <laughs> because the, um, uh, I think we have to do is start with, with what, the reason it's hard is because there's al often multiple steps to achieve a big picture. And I think you need to be very, you need to put together a business case that delivers as it goes. So an example in the, uh, what, for, one of the big things we find is we go to a company and identify, work with them and identify a great AI use case. And it, it turns out, well, you need to invest $5 million to fix your data before you can even get to the AI application. And that doesn't work. Like you're not gonna sell a business case based on that. But how can you, in that same process, maybe strip away with some better predictive analytics, solve some of the problems, create some short-term business value, and, and kind of work toward a vision by doing it incrementally. That, that can work for some organizations. Or you put you, the business case is big enough to go for the whole thing, which a, a few organizations have done. Uh, a life sciences company transformed their whole R&D process with a big, big bet that included acquiring companies in addition to big investments to change their whole R&D process from just science-based R&D with MDs and such to AI and science-based R&D. So that was a big bet in that case with a very different business case. And then finally, should I just, I, I'll make a closing comment along the trust one if you, sure. unless you have anything else. No, to, that's good. The trust, I'd, I'd wind up, wrap up by saying I think there's three things that every company, if you, so what do you do going out of here to tomorrow if you work at a company? I think there's three things that you need to think about. One is technology, because this is different technology. It's different technology platforms. If you're a big company, you need to think about who your partners are, which ones are, are you trusting and working with on AI, and it affects your technology and how you do things and impacts your data architecture and all these things. So technology is really important. You have to start thinking about that. The talent is the second thing, both the, the really, you know, the really, really good AI talent is a lot better than the, the less good AI talent. So how do you get the right AI talent and how do you lay the foundation for the lifelong learning for all the non-AI workers, the talent's the second thing. And trust is your point, I think is the best way to, to end my comments because I think that's the big differentiator of the next period we're moving into. Because in, this, in the environment of a tech lash and concerns that, about some of the questions around how these companies are operating, um, AI is off, offering the potential for every company to do more invasive 
yet individualized, valuable services for their customers. Those companies that have higher degrees of trust are going to be doing the right thing, but they're also going to be getting competitive advantage. Think about uh, what Walmart experimented with, with their, um, recently with uh, their key in-home delivery service. You're going to trust Walmart to actually open the door to your house, walk inside, and deliver goods. And with their grocery services, they would actually open your refrigerator, rearrange your shelves, and put stuff in your refrigerator. Who, who are you going to allow to, to do that? You're going to, you, know, you might not allow your, your brother to do that. You could allow, you could allow Walmart to do it. C customers are. And Amazon has a similar service. In China, that's very commonplace. So the, uh, but the, the trust equation is huge. And those companies that are now destroying trust through exploiting customer data, not respecting the data, not being able to secure the data, have a tough time in the future. So trust is essential, and I think it's a competitive differentiator for companies who can do it right going forward. But it requires a rethink from the era of exploitation, which has been the last 10 years, to an era of working with the consumer to build trust. OK, great. I mean, we're, we're going to have some, before we get to the brief closing remarks from Russell, um, um, I just wanted to thank you personally. I mean, this, this has been sort of a rich and um, sort of deep discussion. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I feel that there's, I wish we could go on for more time, but we've got, we've got alcohol and uh, sort of one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, I mean, I, I, I do also feel that there's, there are so many open questions. I mean, like, you know, the book lays sort of a foundation for a new way of thinking about the impacts of AI on business. Um, but also leaves open a bunch of questions. And for those of you who are sort of academics in the audience or PhD students, I know I see a couple, Elizabeth from Columbia, Prasanna from NYU, the, there's, there's still a ton to be understood. I mean, I think that there's um, like, you know, the, the kind of inquiry that we need sort of at the scientific level to be able to sort of uh, plan for a better future of work and for like the kind of positive future of work that you know, Paul envisions um, the impact of that kind of research will be immense, and so sort of go out and do it. So, um, with that, Russell. So, thanks, Arun and Paul, for a fascinating discussion. And um, my name is Russell Isaacson. I'm an MBA 2007, a member of the Alumni Council. And um, I think a theme tonight was lifelong learning, and your participation exemplifies that. And we encourage you to come to these events and. On that note, I want to just stress that tomorrow, March 28th, is NYU One Day. Um, maybe some of you have heard of it or haven't, but it's basically the, the big day of the year for NYU-wide giving. And last year, Stern exceeded all other schools in donating the most. So we encourage you to keep that up this year. And if you have any questions on that, please talk to me or any of the staff on how you can donate. Um, again, there's going to be books for sale. And Paul's graciously offered to sign books, uh, so we encourage you to stick around and meet each other. And um, just as a token of appreciation. Can I give you guys a gift? Yeah, oh, wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.